welcome to Praxis of Recognition, hosted by Branch Alliance for Educator Diversity, or Branch Ed. My name is Kim Igwe, and I'm the Professional Learning Associate here at Branch Ed. Thank you for joining us. We're honored to have each of you here today. I know you're eager to hear from Dr. Rodriguez. We're going to get started quickly after my three-minute brief intro. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge the disruption in our lives and increase in traumas caused by the global pandemic and other things that may be weighing heavy on our minds today. Even though we can't see each other in this webinar format, we feel the connection that makes us a community, and that is to make the world a better place through education. With that, I will briefly share the mission of Branch Ed. It is our vision to strengthen, grow, and lift up the impact of educator preparation programs at minority serving institutions as being central to efforts to shift the 20% of national representation of teachers of color to a much greater percentage of a diverse and highly qualified teaching force. In doing so, we can and will ensure America's children receive the best education and support as possible. Today is the fifth webinar in our 2021-2022 webinar series on innovative pedagogies. The intention behind this series is to inspire us all to think about educational practice through lenses which center and humanize historically underrepresented and excluded learners. Each webinar features a pedagogical expert. Our hope is that you will walk away with an invigorated teaching philosophy and strategies that revolutionize your practice. Today's webinar, webinar is on the praxis of recognition. Next, we will have pathologic, pathologic, pathologic poverty with Dr. Tyrone Howard and Dr. Carrie Ulucci. These webinars are on the first Wednesday of every month. I'll share the link in our events page at the end of today's session. Before handing it over to Dr. Louis Rodriguez, let me briefly introduce him. Dr. Louis Rodriguez is the interim dean and professor at the University of California, Riverside. He completed two master's degrees and a doctorate in administration planning and social policy from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. His research examines issues in Latinx education, participatory action research, student voice, and educational equity. We are so excited to have you here today, Dr. Rodriguez. I know many of you are eager to engage with Dr. Rodriguez. Please note that there will be time for questions and answers at the end of today's presentation. If you have questions as Dr. Rodriguez is presenting, please put them in the chat and we'll have time at the end for him to answer those questions. And to you, Dr. Rodriguez. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. I'm still, I'm over here on the West Coast, so um, it's about 10 o'clock. Uh, but thank you so much for uh, my colleagues at uh, Branch Education for the invitation to share with you today. I'm really looking forward to spending some time with you and sharing a little bit about my work. Um, and so the title of my presentation is Recognition Backpacks and Espejos or Mirrors, Promoting Additive and Validating Practices for Latino students and other students of color in the education system. So what I'd like to do today is really uh, provide an overview of some of my work over the last 20 years as it relates to um, student engagement, student success, and really finding ways to frame the conversation um, in education for these students. And also to kind of, hopefully you'll be able to walk away with some tools to add to your toolkit and to help benefit those other educators that are, that are working with our students across the country. Um, so with that, we'll get started. So, you know, one of the things that I like to do, and I use this strategy when, in any course that I teach, in any group that I engage, whether it's young people, whether it's through a program, whether it's a group of parents or teachers, whether I'm talking to, to a group of educators um, or leaders in school systems, and here in higher education is I share my educational journey. So my educational journey as a first generation college student, a working class student, a Chicano or Mexican American student, um, growing up in Southern California and urban Southern California, 
Um, I went to public schools. I'm a product of the public school system. And so what I like to do is capture it visually. So what I'm gonna share here on the screen is the actual presentation that I often use when I engage um, with um, various communities. So I went to a school called Colton High School. Late in high school, I realized that I, was, I did not meet the requirements to go to a four-year institution. So I went to San Bernardino Valley College, a two-year community college. Um, and it, it ended up being one of the best moves for me because I learned how to be a student. I learned how to be driven. Um, I grew my kind of tenacity and engagement with education and really found the purpose of education during my community college years. Then I transferred to Cal State San Bernardino, a four-year university. There I became a McNair Scholar. Many of you may be familiar with this program. That really transformed my educational trajectory. That plugged me into an opportunity through the Leadership Alliance at Harvard University. I spent a summer doing research there as an undergrad, um, and I was invited back to apply to graduate school. So after completing my undergraduate degree, I went to Harvard for, as, as um, Kim mentioned in the introduction, um, and then ended up spending several years there working on my, um, my graduate degrees. After that, I went to uh, Florida to be a professor and um, started my tenure track career and then moved back to my alma mater as a professor um, several years later in 2009. And then in the, for the last six years, I've been here at UC Riverside in various roles. But you know, this educational journey that I share is really something that you could probably capture from my CV, my resume. We all have an educational journey. All of our students have an educational journey. But what this journey does not tell you is about my family, where I grew up, how I grew up, how central my family and my parents' struggle was when they were young parents um, having me at 20 years old. Where I grew up in San Bernardino and Colton, right? These were formative spaces and places that shaped who my identity and who I am as a, as a person now. Um, my mentors, right? These are things you wouldn't see on a CV or a resume. My mentors, here's a picture of, of um, Laura Gomez and I, she just retired as an advisor, a counselor at San Bernardino Valley College. She met with me in my early time in, in community college and um, gave me the necessary advice to get me to that next level um, and to transfer in a timely way. We remain in touch today. And here is a picture of us at um, a Latino graduation at San Bernardino Valley College a couple of years ago where we reconnected and I, I was giving the keynote speech there. Finally, my history, my ancestors, my community. Here's a picture of a newspaper out of Southern California called El Chicano newspaper. Here in the, in the picture is um, three people that were being awarded at an event in the middle is Cesar Chavez. To the right is Cruz Reynoso, who was the first Chicano Mexican American um, Supreme Court Justice in California. And my aunt, Bernabe Flores. Um, she was known as uh, Thea Bernie, Aunt Bernie. And she was being honored alongside these two giants in California and US history for her community engagement work um, over the 1950s and 60s. And here she was being honored in 1982 at this event with these two major um, contributors, contributors to, to history. I didn't know about her work until I read and learned a lot more about her work. And uh, while she passed away when I was a very young child, I never really got a chance to um, meet her and, 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 and um, learn about her while she was alive uh, because I was only a child. But you know, over the last several years, I've learned about her contributions and she would advocate for trash pickup in the community, building sidewalks in the community and basic services um, that, that um, the Mexican American community needed at that time in her particular community. And she was being honored for that work. I share all this as part of my educational journey because these experiences shape who I am today. And again, all of our students have an educational journey. All of our educators have an educational journey. All of our leaders in education have this educational journey. And what I do is I share this journey um, as a way to get things going to say, this is who I am. This is what I bring. It's not just about degrees. It's also about the people that we bring along with us, 
the people that inspire us, the people like my Tia Bernie that, that fought for opportunities for me to go study decades before I was even um, engaged in the education system. Um, and so I share my educational journey because again, this is something that I do at the beginning of every class I teach or any space I enter. And this is really the foundation for the three topics I'm gonna to talk about today. Recognition, the mochila or backpacks, and espejos or mirrors, and, and what I call espejo pedagogy that I'm gonna talk about in a second. So with that, I'd like to transition. And to kind of get us started, here's the, the kind of visual uh, metaphor of the backpack. Here you have two students going to school, and while all of our students bring school supplies every year, whether they're kindergartners or graduate students, all of our students bring a backpack to school and their school supplies every year. They bring their scissors and pencils and spiral notebooks and their uh, maybe a tablet, their glue, whatever it is that they use, their books. But in addition to those basic school supplies, they also bring their families. They bring their cultures and their backpacks. They bring their community. They bring their ancestors. They bring their language, their history, their people with them. And I think it's vital that we think about the metaphor of the backpack as a tool to kind of reframe how we understand students once they enter the classroom, right? They don't enter without any of these things. They enter with all of these things. And it's up to us as educators to really affirm and validate those things and use those as tools to really enhance the learning experience and the pedagogical experience in the classroom. So I'm going to return to that in a second. As mentioned in the title of my talk, I talk about um, additive um, perspectives and the importance of additive perspectives. And Paulo Freire is, has had a tremendous influence on my thinking about education. And one of the things that he said is, before you announce, you must denounce. And in addition to Freire, people like Bell Hooks, who just passed away, also had a huge impact on my thinking about the role of education and pedagogy in the classroom and in, in the schools. And so some of the things that are, I think are important to denounce from the very beginning of this presentation is this notion of blaming and othering, deficit perspectives, low expectations, what I have written about in the past called test prep pedagogy, this notion that poverty and race are, are, are deterministic in some way, or that the, our public schools or our public systems are failing. I think it's important that we denounce those things because we have research that shows quite the opposite. Our research actually shows, and I'm announcing that leadership matters. Teachers, mentors, role models matter and require us to invest in those things. Cultural wealth matters that Terry also talks about. This notion of recognition matters that I'm going to expand on in a second from my own work. And student voices and experiences matter. And when we're talking about education, we must center equity and social justice. I mean, these efforts must be deliberate. And I'm making that announcement now. It's not a new announcement, but it's something that we need to kind of name and acknowledge explicitly at the very beginning. So this is kind of the foundation of saying, okay, we're denouncing a group of things and we're announcing a whole other set of things that we know matter in education. So I've been drawing over the last several years, and again, this is kind of building toward my presentation about the role of the mirror. And if the goal of our students is to see themselves, when they look at education or they experience education and they look in the mirror, they should see their brilliance. They should see themselves, their, their family, their community, their history and ancestors in the educational experience, in their teachers, in the curriculum, in the pedagogy. However, in order for our students to see themselves clearly in the mirror, in the educational mirror, there are challenges with that. There are actually some things that are preventing our students from seeing their brilliance. I have been drawing from, from um, some of the Aztec philosophy that looks at the mirror, the role of the mirror in one's identity, in one's development, in one's community, in one's history. And one of the metaphors that I've been using is the notion of the smoking mirror. That there is smoke that prevents our students from seeing themselves clearly in the mirror. But what is that smoke made up, made up of? And some would argue that that smoke is actually providing our students with a distorted version of who they are. And the reason why is because 
the smoke is made up of historical injustices, cultural erasure, racism, damaging policies, discrimination and exclusion, a testing culture, low expectations, zero tolerance policies, silencing of students and communities, deficit thinking, the shortage of teachers and mentors of color, absent relationships, irrelevant curriculum. These are all things that are really preventing our students from seeing their brilliance. And we know this, this is not new. This has been decades and decades in the, in the making. So what I hope to do today is provide three tools that help diminish that, that or get rid of that smoke so that our students can indeed see their brilliance and see themselves clearly in, the, in that mirror. So how can education be leveraged to transform the life trajectories of our young people, especially Latino students and other students of color in our public schools? So that's the kind of key question that I'm going to focus on today. So the first tool, and again, think of these as tools to add to your pedagogical toolkit, a praxis of recognition. This is a set of work that I embarked on 20 years ago, where I was doing my dissertation work in urban schools with primarily uh, Black and Latino students. And I was really interested in the fundamental ways that students were acknowledged or recognized within the school context, especially in environments where there were social, political, and economic challenges. One of the things that I wanted to do is really understand school culture and student voice. And so a lot of my work since then over the last 20 years has really been focused on um, student voice, really listening and understanding and engaging the voices and experiences of students to help understand their experience, but then inform policy, practice, and pedagogy. And the goal has been to really fundamentally um, reimagine the purpose of education. And through this work in spending years in the field and, and really understanding and learning directly from youth and youth of color is that there are at least five types of recognition that I observed. And um, I'm gonna go into detail on the next slide. And they are relational, curricular, pedagogical, contextual, and transformative. And so here's just a kind of mini thought experience experiment that you could go through now and just kind of thinking as you're uh, watching this webinar. And maybe you can take it away with you when you engage with your um, teacher educators, students in your programs, colleagues, and, and even collaborating with the K-12 educators. Um, you know, in, so here's a question. In what ways does your curriculum recognize the existence of Latino students and other students of color? And here are some kind of deeper questions. For example, who are the authors of the articles that you're reading or the chapters or books that you're reading or the text or ideas? Who are those people? You know, what are they reading? Whose perspective matters in that curriculum? You know, who are the profession, professionals in the, in the field? Do students see themselves represented in in those, um, in, in, the, in, in those professions? And who are the people creating knowledge, right? Who gets the opportunity to create knowledge? Who has the power to create knowledge? And so here's a snapshot of um, the five lenses or, 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 or ways of thinking about recognition. Um, so we'll start here, relational. Relational recognition is largely about that, that kind of initial, initial relationship building opportunity. How are students known, cared for, and named? Do we know their names? Do we know how, um, how, they, how they want to be addressed as students? And is there a respect there? The second one is curricular recognition. Um, again, wh whose knowledge matters? Whose expertise matters? Who experience, whose experience matters? And in what ways are our students um, centered in that, in that dynamic? I'll move down here to pedagogical recognition. This is a focus on teaching and learning processes, um, how relations of power are negotiated when it comes to teaching and learning, um, the extent to which students are actually given the opportunity to stand up and present in front of the class and teach the class about whatever it is that they know, teach their teachers about whatever it is that they know, kind of really challenging that historic dynamic where you know, educator is here and student is here, but kind of bringing a way, uh, bringing opportunity um, um, to reimagine what that looks like. The next type of recognition is contextual recognition. You know, 
how does the social, political, and economic conditions of school and society impact the student experience? How does history and cultural context matter? And how does policy matter? Um, these are all key ways that, and, and you could even take each one of these types of recognition and create a whole exercise around them by asking these key questions and having um, future educators and current educators kind of think through their own curriculum, think through their own pedagogy, think through the context in which they work um, and, and, um, and get them prepared to, to engage their students for these kinds of conversations once they're in the classroom. The last one is transformative recognition. I thought it was really vital that it wasn't just about kind of accepting what education is about now in terms of teaching and learning. And, you know, we know there's, um, you know, these traditional approaches around, you know, for testing and grades and things like that. But also thinking about the transformative possibilities of education and asking questions like, what is education for what purpose? Education for social and political change. Education in the Freudian sense for critical consciousness when, when he talks about reading the word and the world, right? It's not just about literacy, but another form of literacy is being able to read the world and providing students with the tools and experiences and the affirmation and validation to read the world, read their communities, read their school context, um, and allowing them to kind of theorize and think through what is all this about and what are the truths that are out there and, and why aren't certain stories being told in our, in our schools and in the curriculum and in our, in our society? Um, so again, these are all different ways to think about recognition within education. Um, and hopefully these, you find these helpful. So here are some, just a kind of a takeaway is, um, in what ways can we provide pre-service and in-service educators with the opportunity to examine the practices of recognition in their schools and classrooms? For example, how do educators practice relational recognition? And how do they know it's working? What kinds of things do they do? Do they share their educational journey, right? As a way to build that community, especially if we ask our students to share aspects of their educational journey. We can't expect our students to tell their stories if we're not willing to tell our stories ourselves as educators. And that's why I think it's vital that we do it on the front end. We share our educational journeys with our students to model that. As educators, we can also think through our practice. You know, do students have the opportunities to create knowledge? If so, how? You know, how are students' voices received in the classroom? I remember teaching many years ago, and I remember spending the night before, spending hours on my lesson, and I used PowerPoint, and I was teaching algebra, and I was all excited about our lesson. And after I got through about a 20-minute setup, one of my students raised his hand and said, hey, mister, you were off today. And I sat there just like perplexed. But what I realized was, yeah, that kind of deflated the air in my balloon, you know, that I just spent so much time and the students, went, at least for this student, it, it didn't work for him. But what I really appreciated was the student felt like he had the opportunity, the agency and the safety in the classroom to share that crit critique with me. And so I took it and I said, I need to do better. What I thought was going to be um, relevant um, with this, for the students didn't, didn't work the way I wanted it to. Uh, but how are students' voices received in the classroom context? Do we give students opportunity to share? And I think that's a vital piece of recognition. And then finally, understanding the power of policy. In what ways have policies, whether they're, they're classroom-based, school-based, district-based, or even larger statewide policies, in what ways have policies impacted the lives of students and schools specifically? And how might you be able to create policies with your students to produce the desired outcomes that you're aiming for as an educator. So again, these are just some ways that you could think about using a praxis of recognition. I encourage you to read my article. Um, it's available, you can find it available online. Um, it's in Teachers College Record. And there's also a video where I talk about um, the article on as a tool that we can use, a very practical tool. While it is rooted in theory, it, it also has some very practical implications um, that you might be able to use as an educator and, and, and engaging um, teacher educators and, and, um, and, and pre-service teachers. So with that, I'd like to transition. And I look forward to your questions at the end. Um, every once in a while, I'm looking at the time. So the second tool I'd like to talk about is the backpack or the mochila. So in the first slide, I talked about my educational journey and the different things that um, 
students can bring. So, you know, over the years, I've been drawing from, I mean, paying attention to what Dora the Explorer has done over the last decade plus, maybe even 15 years. Um, a lot of people are familiar with Dora the Explorer as a cartoon and as a figure um, in, for children's um, engagement through, you know, through, through, um, through the media. Um, and one of the things that's always been perplexing to me is, you know, she's, she's amazing, right? She's bilingual, she's brave, um, she, she's a leader, um, and she and her sidekick boots um, are always helping people uh, in their various, uh, whenever they have a need. Um, and so one of the things that Dora has is this little backpack, the mochila that she calls, right? And it has all of these things whenever she needs them, a life jacket, books, a band-aid, scissors, um, all of these things, an umbrella. She has these different things when, when people need them. Um, and she always steps up and helps. And so I've used this as a metaphor, especially in the times of the pandemic, uh, when students have been really challenging by some of the, the many uh, very real circumstances um, that have been brought by the, by, the, by the pandemic in terms of health, um, stability, economic challenges, housing changes, um, and, 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 and real grief and loss um, that, that many of our communities have faced um, here and around the world. Um, and so as a way to kind of get students to think about their strengths and their skills and, and kind of trying to find ways to affirm and validate who they are and the strengths that they still have, even in these really challenging contexts, is think about Dora. Think about and, and getting them to think about their own backpack, their own mochila, right? And, and, I, and I've been encouraging them to think about as I visit different students in, in both K through 12 schools and, and our own teacher education students and, and students across the school of education is, you know, what do our students bring in their backpacks? And I go back to, I go back to the educational journey. You know, how can we get students to think about their educational journey and not just think about their academic skills, but the other things that inspire them, whether it's family or loved ones or their family and or their community, right? Their ancestors. All of these other things, um, I try to remind them that they have these things in their backpacks, um, that they shouldn't check those things at the door. They should bring those things into the, their learning space. These are the aspects of who they are, of their, their characteristics um, and traits and, and um, skills and knowledge that they have that are uh, fundamental to who they are. And for so many years, they've used those intentionally or not to kind of inspire and push them to be successful in education. And I've invited students recently to think about those things and, and, and bring those things to the center to help them write, that, write those papers, that they're not just sitting in classes in a hybrid environment or an online class um, or back in person by themselves. They never, they never have. They've always brought their community and family with them, their culture and ancestors with them their history with them, their people with them. And I, I just, I think it's really vital that um, we provide our students with the opportunity and an invitation to say, yes, bring those things, bring those aspects of who you are to the classroom um, because they are, are vital to who you are, your identity as an individual and as a member of a community. And um, they should be validated and affirmed. And that these these aspects of who we are in our backpacks that we bring with us every day um, really um, enrich the learning environment, inform the learning environment. It really takes the practice of recognition and even makes it even more practical because it says, I have the capacity as a student to be a theory builder, to be someone that, that knows knowledge, that, that, that can produce knowledge um, based on story based on family, based on that knowledge and, and legacy that has been handed down from one generation to the next. And how can I bring that to the classroom? How can educators really um, provide that invitation to students to bring them into the classroom? So one of the things that I've done is I've actually used the educational journey and this notion of the mochila and created a ped pedagogical activity. So here's then the second one that you can think about for your toolkit is have your students tell their educational journeys to their students. Um, 
it could be wrapped around three formative moments. It could be something, you know, in the, an experience in the fourth grade, we had an amazing, amazing teacher or, uh, you know, working on the school newspaper in the eighth grade or having a, a challenging experience in the 10th grade. But these are all formative experiences that, that people can talk about in their educational journeys and share with their students. And that what could happen is students can then tell aspects of their own educational journey with their classmates as well. And this could be done um, visually, artistically, in writing, in whatever medium one chooses. And you can guide your students um, in these ways. And what ends up happening is students end up telling really powerful stories about themselves, about the kind of collective experience. Students start to see similarities and differences uh, uh, across the experiences that they may have had across in the educational system. Um, you know, I often talk about, I didn't get to talk about it today, but I often talk about, um, you know, being a, an 11th grader and realizing that I should have been taking some key courses like biology to get me prepared and get me um, qualified to apply to a four-year institution. But I was taking a class called life science and it wasn't what are now known in California as the A through G requirements, which are the minimum requirements to get into a Cal State or UC school. How I ended up in a class like life science, I'm not sure. Um, we know from the literature and from years of research that there's a thing called tracking. And I wonder if that was a role, something that played a, a role. And so when I talk, when I go into even more detail in my educational journey, I talk about that moment because that was to me a really key moment. But then later I talk about meeting my counselor in um, community college. And she ended up saying, here's what you need to take for the next two years. Here's a plan. Let's put it down on, in writing. And if you follow this plan, you'll be ready to transfer in two years. And I ended up following that plan and, and, and ended up working for me. But anyway, the educational journey really provides a space and opportunity for students to come together and share these stories. Here's the framework, and I have a paper out in 2018, um, and I call it the, uh, the, it's a framework around healing, building, and thriving. And the reason why it's a healing framework is it provides people who engage in their, with their educational journey to reflect, think about the context, think about history, and think about the role and the power of storytelling to tell one story. Um, when I engage students at the university level, I have them tell their story. Um, and it ends up being a really powerful experience because then I have them connect um, policy and educational theory and social theory to this, these, these themes that they identify um, in their educational journey. Often um, largely do because they hadn't had a, an opportunity prior to my class to really reflect on their own educational journey. Um, a lot of students talk about being um, an English learner and being in different programs and the extent to which those programs worked or didn't work for them and why. And then, so this provides them with an opportunity to kind of think through why that was the case and where were we in terms of language policy in California, for example, when they were a young person and what kinds of programs and policies were at play to really impact their experience. And so it provides them an opportunity to reflect and then make some key connections um, around their own educational journeys that then is connected to um, you know, educational um, theory and, and, and uh, policies and trends in education over time. The next thing that the educational journey pedagogy really helps one think about is the opportunity to build with one another. Students, when they're engaged in a classroom environment, they get to share their own stories with one another. They get to identify these similarities and differences. They, build, they, get, they begin to build agendas. Um, in some of my own research, when I engage in participatory action research with young people in, in, a, in a high school setting, is when we go through this experience, they begin to see that low expectations is something that they a lot of our students experience in the school system. And they begin to ask why. Where did those low expectations come from? How did that shape? their educational experience and what can they actually do about it to, to determine if it's still happening and what they can do to um, challenge that, um, that kind of what, what 
some of my students in the past have called a culture of low expectations. And I've seen this in multiple projects and multiple states as a key finding um, and as a key theme. And so what the educational journeys framework does is allow students to kind of identify that, name it, and then figure out a, a research strategy um, so that the students can collect data, students can create the questions, students can determine what kind of data they wanna collect, students get to analyze the data and students get to uh, propose solutions and build a new agenda. And that's what this framework, this kind of this um, second pedagogical tool that I'm sharing with you now is, is um, how educational journeys and the mochila, the backpack um, serves as a metaphor for that journey. Um, and then the last thing that this framework does is it allows people to thrive right? Um, because students are given the opportunity to share and theorize, you know, they become the public intellectuals. We provide students the platform. We share that platform. We build that platform together to say, okay, once our students have collected that data and come up with some solutions and proposals, where do we share that? And we, we identify those spaces together. Should we share that at a school board meeting? Should we share this with um, in a staff meeting? Should we share this with other youth? Should we share this with parents? Um, how do we want to use um, media tools, social media tools to share this work? And this really provides our students um, with an opportunity to um, reimagine their place in building knowledge. And it's really based on this notion that um, it's one thing to succeed as individuals, but we also have to bring others with us, this notion of lifting as we climb. And then the hope is really to transform policies and practices, right? Um, and pedagogies as well. Once we provide students with the opportunity to build and create knowledge um, and add that to their backpack, add that to the toolkit, it becomes a really transformative opportunity for, for everybody. When, when educators begin to see that approach, um, they also, are transformed by the by the way that students can can really play a key role in in that um, knowledge development and construction. So I'm going to move on to my next tool called the um, the espejo, and I'm going to spend the most of my time here, um, the mirror or the espejo. So I've been really excited about this next phase of my own work, and I've been asking the the question, how can educators use the mirror as a tool to engage with our students, families, and communities? And again, here's the student and here's the mirror. In what ways do our students see themselves reflected in the mirror? And again, the mirror is really a metaphor for education. So think about that for a second. If, if the mirror is a metaphor for education, when students look in that mirror, do they see themselves? How do they see themselves? And when we think about education broadly and all of those critical pieces to education, curriculum, pedagogy, policy, and, and other history, I mean, there's so many pieces to it. How do they see themselves? And do they see themselves clearly? Or do they get a distorted view, a blurry view of who they are? And I'll just take a moment to say that where, you know, where did this concept of the mirror come from? I'm in the process of writing this up now. Um, but there's been a lot of um, influences in my thinking about this. And one of them has been kind of Aztec philosophy. Um, I've, been really, I've been reading over the last few years about um, some of the various um, philosophies that the Aztecs used in the, in the Americas. Um, to, to kind of understand society and, and, and to inform their philosophy and worldviews. And I've taken some of those concepts and say, what does this mean for education? What does this mean for education for students, for Latino students um, specifically? And how might we be able to use it um, as a real practical pedagogical tool for educators to engage our students and kind of reimagine and rethink um, some of the things that we do uh, you know, with, with students in classrooms? So again, I started off to set the context with the smoke, right? And, and, and as, as the smoke prevents our students from seeing their brilliance. 
and is informed by the many things that I mentioned earlier, and I'll just repeat a couple of them, historical injustices, racism, discrimination and exclusion, all of these things are what I call the smoke. The smoke is preventing our students from seeing them, seeing their brilliance in that mirror. And if you look at this visual here, again, these are the things that make up the smoke. And there's probably a whole lot, a whole lot more. But these are the things that are preventing our students from seeing themselves clearly in the mirror. So what I did is I worked with the research team and we, how did we get to this notion of the mirror and the power of the mirror? I, I started this research project several years ago where I was working with um, a group of, of researchers, undergrads, grad students, postdocs, and we went out into the community and we were working with a predominantly group of Latino students in a Latino high school. And we asked the question, how do Latino youth describe, define, and experience excellence in their homes, schools, and communities, especially at a really challenging time um, in, our, in our history, in our country? And what we did is we used photo voice, we used educational journeys that I mentioned earlier, we used uh, powerful ideas in education, we talk about um, Yoso's community cultural wealth, we used a project uh, called the Loteria Project, uh, we've recently published on this topic, and we talk about the history of educational inequality to kind of set the foundation for this project. And then we engage in this collective data analysis um, process. And so one of the things that we found is that students, and in this case, Latino students, they look into their various social ecologies for excellence. And they have, there are, um, there's evidence of excellence in all of these aspects of their, these parts of their social ecologies, whether it's school, especially through programs or the classroom, opportunities that they may have, their families, their communities, and then their larger kind of ancestral legacies that students intentionally or not draw on these social ecologies of excellence, if you will, um, as evidence of excellence that, that really inform their excellence as, as individuals and then in turn kind of inspire them. But here's the challenge. A lot of times the classroom is not the space to bring in those aspects of excellence and who they are. And that's one of the things that we found. Um, unless we intentionally make that happen. So we found specifically family is what's made up of that mirror. Their culture and their language, their ganas are what's, what's known as their desire, their persistence, right? Their struggles, their, their parent struggles, their community struggles, their communities, their schools, their neighborhoods, society, mentors, teachers. These are all things that make, that make up that mirror. And that's where they go for influence. That's where they go for inspiration. But again, the question is, do we allow these things, these aspects of who they are, their realities, to, to come into the classroom, to inform their learning, um, to, the, to inform their the pedagogical and, and knowledge construction experience that they have in the classroom? And that's the big question mark, right? Um, and so what we try to do through this research is actually provide intent to provide an intentional way of, of, um, of bringing that to the, to the educational space. So, what, so here's a, another way of looking at this visual. So I kind of um, reimagined it and I, and I was thinking if, edu if education is really about um, exploring who we are, who we've been, and where we're going, and what I call, if you follow my arrow here, the purpose of education and moving in this kind of upward trajectory, trajectory um, that in order for our students to see their brilliance in themselves, in their family, their community, their history, their ancestors, we need to clear the smoke. And in a, way, a way to clear that smoke so that they can see themselves clearly is through equitable policies, through culturally relevant pedagogy through the praxis of recognition that I talked about earlier, through affirming their culture, language, and history, through high expectations and support, through meaningful relationships, through family engagement, through learning over testing, through pedagogies of the home that Dolores um, Delgado Bernal talks about, 
through recognizing cultural wealth through the work of Terry Oso, ethnic studies, the power of curriculum, the power of pedagogy, the power of history, right? The power of students seeing themselves, seeing their stories represented in that curriculum. That's the power of, the, of ethnic studies today and historically. This notion that honoring student voice is powerful, it's transformative. These are all the things that we know in education clear that smoke. When we put these kinds of things in place, policies and practices and pedagogies, students begin to see themselves clearly in that mirror. Community, what I call community relevant curriculum. So we know that there's been um, culturally relevant pedagogy, culturally sustaining pedagogies and curriculum. And I've been thinking about the last several years about the role of community relevant curriculum. When we look at the local level, to what extent do students get to see themselves and understand the people and initiatives and efforts like my Thea Bernie, the, the work that people have done to help improve community, to help improve opportunity at the very local level, right? It's one thing to learn about kind of nationally known figures, but it's another thing to know about people at the local level. And, and over the last 10 years, I've been doing work called excellence campaigns where um, I engage a group of people at the local level and we kind of define what excellence means to us at the local level and identify people and in, in initiatives and efforts where people are actually um, living up to that notion of what excellence means at the local level. And that's what I mean by kind of curriculum re relevant, I mean, community relevant curriculum. Again, these are all practices and pedagogies and policies um, that are supported by the research, supported by the literature, supported by scholars and work that has been done for years, for decades. And the, when we put these things in place, that's what allows our students to see themselves clearly in the mirror. So I'm going to end here with, when students look in the mirror, I think our current system is largely focused on encouraging students to see themselves solely through school and academics, grades, test scores, good behavior, right? St that, this ends up in a situation where students might say, I'm a 2.0 student, I'm a one, or I'm, an, I'm a two on the, the standardized test. And students begin to develop these identities to a certain extent in a very narrow way. And while academics are important, absolutely, Developing those foundational skills, absolutely. Students need to know how to write strong essays and um, engage with math and engage with, with um, writing and reading and all these various forms of, of literacy, that that's not the only mirror that reflects who our students are. I'm proposing through academic espejos or academic mirrors that our students have multiple mirrors happening at the same time or present at the same time. When students look in the mirror, they see culture and language at the same time that they see history and ancestors. Because if, just imagine this, imagine being in a classroom, a student is standing in the middle of that classroom and their peers are holding mirrors around them. And each of those mirrors represents what you see here on the screen. Brilliance, school, sacrifice and hard work, history, right? Each of these mirrors surrounding the student represents um, who they are. But when they look in the mirror of brilliance, guess what? They see their family and they see their history and ancestors also reflected in that mirror of brilliance. Because when they look in that mirror, they look directly at that mirror and they could see behind them. And that's where you see community and culture and school and sacrifice, all of those simultaneously present. And so what I'm proposing is that academic espejos or academic mirrors are present for our students all the time. But again, it's up to us to use that as a tool, as a strength, as affirmation in the classroom to invite students to bring those aspects of who they are into the classroom. So with that, I will end with this. If education is truly about um, understanding our past, present, or future, or who we are, who we've been, or where we're going, that our students here at the middle, and they have multiple mirrors, that our students should be um, seen in their education mirror, in their educational mirror, who they are, who they've been, and where they're going.
And I will end there. Thank you so much for the opportunity and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, for sharing your thinking and your work with us. Um, I want to open it up for question uh, for questions for you. Um, if you have any questions, please share them in the chat. Um, if you have any questions for Dr. Rodriguez, we'll, we'll wait a moment and see if any come up. Great. Um, we have one question around being able to see this video later on. It will be on Branch Ed's um, YouTube channel, so you'll be able to view it there. Great, I'm seeing more questions coming in. Um, learning over testing will be a major shift in our school systems. How do we get administrators and ed policymakers interested in clearing the mir mirrors to make this shift happen using your framework? Yeah, thank you, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I think a uh, foundational piece is, you know, drawing on the literature and the research that has shown um, the, the challenges that uh, focus on testing has, or testing alone has on students. This is not new. This is, there's re decades of research on this particular topic. Um, but I think by using the, the notion of the mirrors, I think it, it broadens um, leaders and policymakers' understandings of students' identity, right? It's not just about preparing them for a test, but they're bringing their multiple, various forms of their identities to the education space. And um, I think by, by encouraging policymakers and leaders to kind of think through that, um, understand that um, various parts of the students, it's not just about their academic identity there. We all bring our entire selves to our work. Um, and I think um, they, the same could be said about them as well, right? Um, both administrators, leaders, um, policymakers as well, they bring themselves to the work. And I think we need to try to find ways to provide um, platforms for students to thrive and platforms for educators to thrive. Thank you for the question. Thank you so much, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, how can an EPP work with school districts to impact existing teachers? Um, what's EPP? Um, educational preparation programs. Okay. You know, I think right now in the current context, um, districts are, we're seeing this locally, districts are really open and excited and looking for support from teacher ed programs and, and schools of education specifically. Um, I think capitalizing on some of the, the knowledge and the expertise that um, some scholars and programs have around teacher development would be really helpful. And working in partnership with the districts, I think is really key. Um, and providing, um, you know, I would, we always have to think about the reciprocity of always giving back, right? Always, always supporting our, our districts and, and local school systems. Um, and I think bringing these, bringing this knowledge and bringing these um, ideas uh, could be really, really powerful for, for educators. And it could really build this synergy between EPP programs and, um, and local districts. Thank you, thank you uh, for the question. I'm gonna give it one more moment for one last question if there's one outstanding one that someone has. Um, how can we read more about your pedagogies and book any books or publications you would suggest? Great, yeah, absolutely. I have. Uh, I have four books out that address a lot of these topics. Um, I have a book called Intentional Excellence. Um, I have a book called The Time Is Now. Um, I have a book called Par Entre Mundos. Um, those three books really capture the last 10 years, 10, 15 years of my work. And you could find those on, you know, wherever, um, Amazon or wherever you purchase your books. Um, and then uh, you could just Google, um, my name and you'll see there's a there's a ton of my articles out there all related to this um i have a website um and you can find that on the web um and also if you're connected to a university or have access to some of these are open access articles so you could just google my name and you'll see um our articles and links and things like that thank you thank you for the question Dr. Rodriguez, thank you so much for your time and sharing your thinking with us and your work with us. We just truly appreciate it um, from the Branch Ed community. 
our next event is March 3rd at 12 p.m. Central um, and 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Dr. Tyrone Howard and Carrie Yulucci, who will discuss how to move past the mythologies about poverty that surface in classrooms towards strategies for educating students from impoverished backgrounds. You can register using the QR code on the screen or using the link in the chat. Lastly, we would love to hear about your experience today by taking a brief poll. It should pop up momentarily if you can answer those that one question for us, that would be great. And with that, thank you for your time today, um, Dr. Rodriguez and sharing your knowledge with us. And thank you for everyone who was able to attend. Again, this will be posted um, on our YouTube channel. And if you registered for this event, you will get an email um, with the recording as well. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye.